I talk a lot about mitochondria and how important their health is for the health of the cell. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, exactly what mitochondria are. Let's give maybe a, a high level clinician's overview. And then I want to highlight two therapies that I use in clinical practice in order to support mitochondrial healing and health. So I'll share my screen here. All right, so what we have here is a cross section of mitochondria. And so if you look at the tiny little rectangular image at the top, you see what looks like a bean shaped object. Um, so that would be that would technically be a mitochondrion. And that would be us seeing a mitochondrion when it's cut in half. Now, we don't just have a couple of these in each cell, right? We've got hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of these. We have a ton of mitochondria in our cells. Um, and, and, you know, depending on the energetic demands of the cell, we're going to have, we're going to have a need for more and more mitochondria. So for example, the brain is going to have a lot more mitochondria per cell than say, um, even the muscles, right? So we kind of, it kind of gets distributed based on what the energetic demands of the particular cell and tissue is. And so we've got tons of these mitochondria inside of our cells and they require a very specific spacing of something called the electron transport chain. So um, when you actually take a cross section, we, when you blow up what it looks like um, a cross section of where we're looking at the mitochondrial electron transport chain here in the larger image, you see that we have an outer membrane to the mitochondria and an inner membrane to the mitochondria. And we have um, these, these shapes that are embedded in the inner membrane. And so these shapes are representative of di different proteins that are part of something called the electron transport chain. And their job is to take electrons or move electrons from food and other sources into the mitochondria and pass these electrons through the electron transport chain to ultimately make water at step four. So step four is something that I love to highlight when it comes to mitochondrial health, because this is where water is made. And through the lens that I work with in terms of supporting health, I believe that having adequate amounts of exclusion zone water inside the body is paramount to all to ultimate health of the body and also as a defense mechanism against toxic burden. And so, you know, I go into a ton of detail about that in my practitioner trainings. Um, but that being said, so we get electrons, they flow through the mitochondrial uh, electron transport chain, but in order for them to conventionally pass through this electron trans or not conventionally, but in order for them to um, effectively pass through this electron transport chain, the mito these respiratory proteins, these electron transport chain proteins, complexes one, two, three, and four, CoQ10 and cytochrome C oxidase, they can't be spaced too far apart. They require a very exact spacing and distance. And they require exclusion zone water between them, you know, which is uh, what's called an excited version of water or water that's already got a negative charge to it, which makes it a lot easier for electrons to pass and flow through. If these respiratory proteins space out too far and or we lose exclusions on water between them, and typically both happen, that's a, that's a fairly synonymous thing, you lose exclusions on water and then we see this spread, all of a sudden mitochondria become less efficient at tunneling electrons or moving electrons through. The consequences of this are the productive of things like reactive oxygen species, excessive reactive oxygen species, uh, a lack of water production and a lack of ATP production um, very much uh, sets the cell up for uh, a state of chronic inflammation and low energy. So all of a sudden, when we have enough mitochondria in a given tissue um, becoming dysfunctional to this extent, then all of a sudden these tissues just start to um, express symptoms. And then these symptoms can sometimes be labeled a disease. Um, but that being said, the foundation is what's happening at the level of the mitochondria. And so what can we do to support this, right? Well, and I talk in my, in my courses, I talk a lot about the toxins that can damage this or the things like circadian rhythm disruption or non-native EMFs that can damage this spacing. But one of my really favorite stacks in terms of therapies that can put these together, oh, here's just another image where we actually we see the spread, right? It, listen, I'm not tech savvy. I basically took the image above, which you should recognize the respiratory proteins at the correct spacing. And then below, I just essentially stretched it, right? So you can see how much harder it would be for an electron who only likes to tunnel so far to, to get lost from its ability to tunnel when the distance increases. And so there's a couple of things that I like to do to support this. And one of my favorite stacks, if it's if a client is... Um, is not low leptin, um, is to do cold exposures followed by red light therapy. 
Cold exposures acts as a beneficial stressor. It's called a hormetic stressor. I'm not gonna talk about that in this particular video, but I am gonna talk about how cold optimizes the mitochondria. So when we get cold, we turn on something called our brown adipose tissue, which is tissue that is designed to keep us warm. It's full of mitochondria. And when the body start, when body temperature starts to decrease, mitochondria actually do something called uncoupling, where they, they um, instead of optimizing electron transport chain flow, instead they, they allow the flow of protons back into the intermembrane space, the matrix of the mitochondria. Let me go back so you see exactly what this means. In this particular image, you see what it says here in the intermembrane space, 4H, 4H, 2H. This is actually, as we're as electrons are being donated to the mitochondrial electron transport chain, they're being carried by um, products of the Krebs cycle, right? So you see NADH, that H, that hydrogen, is a carrier of electrons to the electron transport chain and hydrogen, or naked hydrogen, that's why it's H+, plus, a proton essentially, that goes into the intermembrane space. And the mitochondria are designed to build up this gradient, this concentration, this pressure of hydrogen in the intermembrane space and they have they 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 build up this pressure and the out route for that pressure when when a mitochondria is just functionally normally is to go through the ATPase and the speed with which this proton goes back through the ATPase generates ATP now things can jam that up right um yes toxins can yes deuterium can you know uh, too big of a scope to talk about here but I do talk about it in my courses but so we have this, we have this concentration of protons in that intermembrane space. Here you also see it represented as H plus as well. And so all of a sudden when the mito, when the body senses cold, it tells those brown adipose mitochondria, hey, warm up, warm, warm us up, warm us up. And so instead of allowing the majority of the protons to pass through the ATPase, they open up a channel called UCP2 stands for uncoupling protein two. And all of a sudden, all of these protons then flow back into the matrix, the inner portion of mitochondria, and the flow of protons generates heat. And so that's also why mitochondria are designed to run warmer than the rest of the cell in general. Um, but we can actually generate extra heat through this uncoupling protein too. Uh, and that's in response to cold. So what all of a sudden now, this heat that's being generated by the mitochondria, that's infrared, right? Heat is infrared. And infrared actually helps to build easy water. So all of a sudden, if we've got these proteins that are too far spread in the electron transport chain, and now all of a sudden we need them to have, to, to bring them back together, one of the best ways to do that is to build the easy water between them. So all of a sudden we build the exclusions on water between them. This allows these respiratory proteins to have this excited water. And because exclusion zone water is denser than bulk water, the non-exclusion zone version of water, it actually also helps to pull the proteins back together into a tighter, uh, into a uh, shorter distance for optimum electron tunneling. So all of a sudden, there we go. We get to apply the cold to help to, uh, we, we apply cold in, in various therapeutic ways, which I talk about in my courses. And again, it's not for everyone. And there are some key ways to do this, but we can use, definitely use cold as a means of optimizing um, those respiratory proteins to the optimum spacing. So then how does red light therapy come into play? Well, red light therapy that does so much for the mitochondria. I'm not going to talk about subcellular melatonin here, um, but what I am going to say is, or I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to talk about necessarily how it um, kicks off nitric nitric oxide. But what it does do is it optimizes the water viscosity. So there's water running through the ATPas. There's layers of water going through um, this image at the top. That cytochrome C oxidase, or step four of the electron transport chain. And when that particular um, protein receives red and near infrared light, and when the water surrounding these proteins receives red and near infrared light, that optimizes the production of water and ATP. So essentially we do something to the mitochondria to help pull them back together for optimum electron flow. Then we apply a light exposure that further optimizes the production of water and ATP. And you get this really beautiful system where the mitochondria are now becoming very functional again. And I will talk about the melatonin here briefly, but as the, as the mitochondria are also being exposed to the near infrared light, 
they make their own melatonin. It's called subcellular or mitochondrial melatonin that then goes on to scavenge a lot of reactive oxygen species and calms oxidative damage that's likely occurring in the dysfunctional mitochondria or the cells that contain dysfunctional mitochondria. So you'll see a decrease in the DNA damage, the lipid peroxidation, you'll see an improvement in mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial dynamics. So there's a lot of beautiful things that can take place through the lens of combining cold and red light together to support your mitochondria, the mitochondrial health of your clients. So hope you found this interesting and I look forward to chatting with you next time.